you know i know you're juggling so many things but thanks so no, much for okay. taking out the time today and sure. joining me um you know you really ab adams needs no introduction but i do want to just go through you know your accomplishments a quick a quick glance at them before we move any further aba adams has created an enviable reputation as an innovative educationist a prolific writer on education and an accomplished orator she has spent over 35 years in education media arts management both in india and the uk as former director of the shri ram schools and advisor education to step by step noida she has been instrumental in founding and developing two major educational institutions in the country i totally agree my children were in step by step she conceptualized and led the center for learning and teaching which focused on teacher capacity building mentoring and coaching but presently she is leading a leading educational consultant and vice chair of the ahwan trust working with multilateral agencies state governments and foundations on policy and strategy to upgrade government schools and ensure successful learning outcomes by developing curricula and teacher skills and proficiencies which i think is absolutely the need of the hour um it it it's a uh, you know there's more i'm sure there's more you just give I, i've just <laughs> given up no there isn't any more <laughs> and it makes me sound as old as the hills which i am no but you know it was fascinating for me to read the theater part of it in there ah. it really was That's, yeah. that's where i was that that's where i got stuck and i was like oh wow because you know i'm always i'm always encouraged by people who go beyond what i think is the comfortable and have that other little thing on the side which is fascinating so anyway i'm not going to take much time okay. and dive into the conversation uh you know miss adams i think there's a, now the, the talk about taking our children back to schools is gaining a lot of momentum we're, you know we're all saying it's time i think parents a lot of pa- parents for the wrong reasons have been also saying it's time but my point is that is it as simple as that to take our uh, children back to the classroom should we not first be assessing the damage that they've gone through you know the the magnitude of that lost year not just the lost year uh just now first call me abha uh um, mrs adams uh, makes me Miss. feel as if i'm back at school so and i'm not oh yes uh, <laughs> and i'm not and i'm not a school parent either so that's good that's right that's right um you know you're absolutely right uh, i think i speak for everyone's feelings and emotions when i say that these have been truly unprecedented times a lot of children told me that they spoke to their grandparents and asked them dada have you ever been through a time like this uh was it like partition and uh, dada ji apparently said that uh, bachche there we knew there was a war but we could uh, see the enemy or what sadly we thought was the enemy but yahan pe it feels like a war there is loss every day during the second wave everybody lost somebody and the trauma of that is something we need to recognize so before we bring our children back into school we need to recognize two or three very crucial things number one that over the last and it will be almost 24 months since our children saw the inside of a classroom okay. um during this time many children have been born many have become toddlers and many have graduated from the 2 plus to primary and sadly many have left school at the other end of the spectrum without the joy of that valediction party the graduate the farewell all of that and many are still in a limbo uncertain about what the future holds for them so anxiety which is not just there in the children and i'll go over the stages of anxiety um through the sort of different childhood years to be taken into account it's anxiety for all the stakeholders for the children for the parents for the teachers we are expecting so much of our teachers during these what we call now and we'll probably go down in history as covid times teachers have been like the frontline warriors and i speak for educators everywhere they have scrambled to discover new ways of teaching and learning 
those that schools that could afford the whole digitization and the leap into digitization and online learning did so. Those that couldn't, as in government schools, created worksheets which were WhatsApp to children and the children responded. Teachers have been calling children in many schools that I'm aware of, government and private, to check up on them. How is everybody? And you know, so we've all been through this and this needs to be acknowledged before we embark and think we can pick up from where we left off. We can't. There has been too much emotional water under the bridge. Learning loss aside, there is this whole aspect of the socio-emotional well-being. So as schools grapple with this, I'm going to sort of split it um, and talk about it. First about the foundational years. Just now, if you remember as a child, you grew up amongst other people and babies grow up learning from around them. Yes, they, they grow up with sensory experiences they grow up with hearing different voices talk to them in you know, baby talk, as they do. But they have all this, this stimulation. And that means that when a child's brain gets, in a sense, stimulated through, this sen through these senses, then uh, neural pathways begin to form. When a child does not get this particular input, the neural pathways don't form and the brain doesn't develop as quickly and as roundedly as it should. And neuroscience tells us that, that now between the ages of zero to eight is the maximum capacity building of our brain. So those children who have been born during this time have had a huge deficit of this learning through socialization. I have various instances, which I quote in my book about children who have only seen a mother or a father, or perhaps a didi who's there. If a nana or a nani, dada, dadi, if they're fortunate enough to be around coming, the children scream. Any stranger comes in, they scream. If they take the child out beyond the comfortable natural environments, they are uncomfortable. So there is that fear. So that deficit is something we have to be very, very, very aware of in the foundational years. Another deficit that has, I think, cropped up in my opinion, is that of play. Children learn through play. We all grew up playing outside and we played with whatever we could find. We didn't play with toys and gadgets alone. Well, there weren't many gadgets in my time, <laughs> no, but no, you know, so mine either. exactly. There were trees, there were shrubs, boxes. We created games for ourselves. Mm -hmm. When children play with each other in this free, unstructured way, Again, what happens is that they develop certain skills. They develop the skills of negotiation. whatever. They develop skills of planning. They develop skills of analyzing what went wrong. They develop communication. They develop compromise and adjustment and learning to live with each other. And... Um, uh, Sonia Phillips, who is a dear friend and an eminent educationist, uh, calls it that these are executive functions that are very necessary as skills, as life skills. And this cause, if you don't play enough in an unstructured way, it causes a deficit of these executive decision-making skills. And that goes on through life. So in the foundational years, we have seen this very clear deficit that's happened. Um, if we move on to the primary, suddenly those who were able to go online have had online classes. But I'm skeptical about the, um, how deep an online learning, frankly, can be. Because assessments are done, but we are still in a kind of a research phase as far as that is concerned. Senior school children, by and large, could be self-directed learners but they too are missing the socialization. Speak to any child, they want to get back to their friends. They want to get back to their teachers. As human beings, we need people. So if these are the various um, you know, areas that we have to address, 
How do we go about it? Two scenarios. Number one, that schools don't open for a while. I know that Haryana has opened up for classes 9, 10, 11, 12, and classes 6 to 8. I think Puducherry has also opened up. Maharashtra, certain districts have opened up. Many states are watching for the outcome of August and whether there will be a third wave. Because if they open up and there's a third wave, then it's back to square one. So in the event schools don't open, December, November, it will have been 24 months practically, particularly for children in Delhi. Think back to um, December 2019. And that was the time that I think the elections were on. So schools were disrupted, if I'm not mistaken. January, the riots broke out in the Northeast. Yeah. Schools were disrupted. By February, sorry, elections were in February. We then began to get an understanding that something was amiss on the health front. And by March, there was a complete lockdown, right? So a child who was three plus is now going to be five plus, technically kindergarten, has not had any preschool or nursery learning, you can't pick up from kindergarten the concepts that you have planned for kindergarten. So many state governments, and I know that many private schools, are considering a bridge program. So a three-month program that will look carefully at what are the concepts that children need to know in the form of a ladder, which they have lost out over two years. And how can we start with building those concepts. I think three months is not enough. I think six months may not be enough either, but that only time will tell. So there is a two year learning loss for a child in class four, they're going into class six, and Jyotsna, you know what a leap that can be. That, yeah. that is one of the biggest leaps possible. Middle so, school. and yes, and then um, middle school comes with its own, uh, uh, curriculum challenges, it comes with its own, uh, you know, the diversification of subjects, it comes with a changed environment, where suddenly your home teacher or your class teacher is not there as a stable, you know, uh, fulcrum for you anymore. And uh, you have many teachers. And that's the time when your hormones are raging. And you are confused. And you are pre, you know, in full blown adolescence by then. And so there is no focus, there is no self-regulation, and it's going to be so very hard. Um, so bridge programs that are carefully, carefully calibrated, constructed are one way. But in the meantime, before they come to us physically, what can we do? Those schools that have um, uh, online teaching um, and have, uh, let's say, developed the fine art of online teaching, are going to do okay. But for 65% of India's population who go to government schools, it's not going to be okay. Even amongst government schools, one smartphone is shared by three or four members of the family. You see, you hear, read um, of stories of children studying by, you know, you know under, under a, a tree lamp, or a palm, absolutely, yeah. with, with one, one phone. Yes. How do you study on a phone? Jyotsna, I have difficulty just, just, just typing out a WhatsApp. And, <laughs> and you know, this was a major yeah. challenge. And if I didn't yes. have my son to set it up and my daughter in order to set it up, I wouldn't be able to do it. Mm -hmm. But yeah. so I, I think that that has caused a huge, there's a lot being written about the digital divide, but that has also caused a huge divide. So in the meantime, what can we do? Now, I've been, uh, I have a little bit of a bee in my bonnet about uh, and this goes back to my experience in the UK, where I worked as an education producer for several years with the BBC. And I saw the power of television when it came to um, learning. And it depends very much on the kind of treatment that you give a particular subject. But you are able to, you know, in an engaging, fun way, get children to learn. I don't know why we haven't done that. Now, there are some apps that are very expensive. Everybody can't afford them okay. that are able to do that. But for 
the underserved for the 65% and above of the population, those apps are not a reality. And they cannot subscribe to those apps and I'm not going to name them. Interestingly enough, the, most of the content is um, not um, contextual. So we have a lot of cartoons that we see on many of the channels, but they are all imported. We have no real connect with them other than Beam and other such uh, things. So Definitely. I've been uh, advocating for a while now that low cost learning through mass media via Doodarshan, people may not have smartphones, but 97% of the people have a television. And in the rural areas particularly, the reach is there. DD has a tremendous terrestrial reach. You know, uh, the other uh, um, um, platforms may be charging, uh, you know, um, fees and there may be a financial implication. So you may not have a Tata Sky connection. But a Doodarshan connection, you will have through your cable operator and it'll be free. So... I've been pushing for that for the foundational years because class six will come back. But what about that foundation? And it's these foundational years of three plus, four plus, five plus, six plus, and seven plus, all the way up to eight, that are, you know, that's where your, this a need, where your foundation is built. Those are, and your building blocks of learning grow from that. If that is weak, and it has been weak all this time, it is, uh, we have a lot to be grateful for, for the National Education Policy 2020, which has made this a subject of focus, yes. that every state has to do it. I just hope that the money is made available for it. I mean, on the one hand, we have NEP 2020, and on the other hand, we have 6,500 crores slashed from the education budget. So somewhere in my head, that doesn't quite square up. But yeah. uh, perhaps something will happen. I don't know. I'm, right. I'm, no, I was going to ask you about the budget. It's, it just goes <laughs> one way <laughs> and the wrong way. As an educationist, I've learned that you have to be an optimist. If you are not optimistic about the future, you have no business being in education. So I'm optimistic about several things. Number one, that um, the powers that be will see the sense in investing in the foundational years of learning and make the money available. Number two, I see the resilience, Jyotsna. I see the resilience in spite of all that's happened in our young people. And um, bear with me while I share a story or two. I've seen the children who, um, when I left uh, step by step, um, who were in, say, grade 11, they completed grade 12. I interviewed them for my book when they were in grade 10 and 11. And then I sort of hooked up again to find out how they'd been doing after the pandemic. And I cannot tell you the difference that I saw in many, not all. Some were so badly impacted by anxiety and depression, but we have a strong enough relationship for them to share that with me, to say, I'm falling apart, ma'am, and I do not know where I'm going. Um, for others, it was a wake-up call to dig deep down when they began to lose grandparents, uncles, aunts, and young people, young cousins. They had to find the strength. They all got involved with um, voluntary organizations. And they began to um, um, find the ambulances, find the oxygen uh, concentrators for people, you know, connecting um, um, time and time again with those in need, uh, which gave them a purpose. They got disciplined. These were privileged young people whom you had to drag out of bed at midday and parents mm -hmm. thought that was going to be the case, but who realized that it was now up to them because the world, as they saw it, was uncertain, could not be depended upon, yeah. was fragile, fractured, and they would need to get up and face it. 
and doing so they faced their fears they used all their skills of technology to help other people and i saw that being very very evident and in in all of that they took a gap here they um built other skills but here we are talking about the privileged kids what about those who are underserved you know uh, so there the picture is a very different one so where through the cracks right yeah children had to become the breadwinners as parents lost jobs uh, parents children had to become the parents as parents went into depression domestic violence on both fronts um a lot of pain a lot of early uh, uh, girls being married off early in uh, areas of uh, himachal boys being sent to tutorials or tutors girls being sent to the cotton fields to pick cotton in telangana because they needed the money okay so um how do you come back from that you have to come back from that keeping all of this in mind and reaching out now through mass media to the children and to the parents and to the teachers and building programs that will bridge the trauma as well as build the learning loss that will not expect things to pick up where we left from and that this is a journey that schools and that by that i mean private and government schools educators parents and children have to take together hand in hand schools can't have expectations here right you're back now here's your homework here's your assignment sunshine if, if you don't deliver yeah. you know you can't do that anymore. i've always said that actually uh you know when i was even researching and this is just before the pandemic that i think there has to be a somewhat a different a more holistic embracing of students going to school as well but you yeah. know before i come to that um you were just mentioning we were talking about children falling through the cracks that the gender disparity of this pandemic is also very evident isn't it girls are the yeah. first one who are losing out on education losing out on so much losing out on some things like even vaccine you know if 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 someone has to get it let's just get, give it to the boy or the man of the house they're just falling and falling and they i mean it, it's it's a huge crisis right yes it is it is and you know you have to uh unless you read the right columnists and the right sort of uh, uh niche papers if you like you you have to look for this why isn't it that, okay so i will have to confess that i've stopped watching television Yeah. I uh, just can't stomach up the screaming anymore. Yeah. yeah. So I uh, <laughs> I don't don't do that. Either. Yeah. All right. So why but why isn't it um making headlines? Um why is it that I have come to know about this when I'm having a deep conversation with uh with the uh, um the leader of an NGO that works with children in adversity. Um why isn't it why are we talking more about this yes, we're not just as we don't talk about our children's mental health which is you know which is down the tube in my opinion and has been for the Mine last too. 10 years my yeah? too yes but uh it it's not flag it's it's not a red flag no. sadly you know uh yes it's 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 now becoming much more acknowledged um but children as young as 8 having anxiety attacks what how much fear and this is only going to exacerbate it so will we be able to get those girls who have been sent out i have lost your audio okay okay you're back my battery is running out or something like that okay, okay. um but i'm not sure that those girls who uh um should not be in a Uh, should not be married have been married at 15 yeah. and some have run away from home yeah. so and the, and that's only going to increase right i mean you want to just that's right yeah for, for, right. for single mothers who lost their husbands in the pandemic 
uh, or, or, right. or, or orphans, frankly, I that's mean, right. who are in charge that's of right. relatives, they're just going to dispose them off. The first that's right. person that comes along their way. It, it, it's, right. a, it's a very dire situation, isn't it? It is. It is. And my screen is now kind of fading. So oh, I no. don't know why. It, uh, sh shall I try and stick it on charge and walk around yes. a bit and yes. see Perhaps whether that can. works? Yes. Um, and then I'll put you on speaker if I may, because no I may not be able to um, see. This is the kind of thing I was. Hi, Justa, can you hear me? Yes. Yes, yes, I can hear you. Right. I can oh. hear you. But you know, I can yeah, the thing is the way... So I'm sorry about that. Oh, no. Oh, you can't? Um, I've tried to put it up as high as possible. But anyway, okay. let's, let's carry on. So the thing is that, you know, when we're talking about bringing these children back who've missed years, uh, you know, who've gone straight, as you said, from, you know, they should have been in kindergarten, they've gone straight into year one or, or that whole discrepancy. The other thing is, of course, that these children are many of them who are going to come back to school are not going to be disciplined. It's been a very different life outside, right? I'm so glad you mentioned that. Um, I wouldn't call it disciplined. I would just say that children have had emotionally a very rough couple of years um, where they have not understood what is happening to them. So the fear and the anxiety, the uncertainty, the changes in the situation, many have become extremely aggressive. And again, this is feedback from uh, my students who said, uh, you know, ma'am, it's impossible to control my nephew. Um, he just is kind of um, uh, bouncing off the walls all the time because he has all this energy, nowhere to go. And frankly speaking, if you're living with your parents 24-7 without a break, and that's all that you do or see, people get on each other's nerves as well, you know, yes. and there's no space to go. So this kind of incarceration has also, will also, um, I think, uh, reflect in aggressive behaviors when they come back, uh, the inability to... Uh, to stay centered, right, and to stay yeah. calm, which is why the emphasis on the <laughs> socio-emotional well-being at all times um, as a very important ingredient of bringing our children back to school yeah. is really critical. And I think it's really hitting us, the social isolation, right? I mean, it's not just the Jutsi, seven, I'm sorry, eight I can't hear you. Oh, you can't? Okay, let's give this a try. Otherwise, I think we have spoken a lot and it'll be okay. Do you want to just disconnect and try and join again? Is, is that okay? I can hear you. If you can hear me. All right. Yes, yes. I'm just trying to think. Clearly, my iPhone has um, become too old like me. My children have been not at at all. one and I've been... Not, at, not <laughs> at all. Not at all. So, so it has discharged itself. Uh, no, I think it's, it's called COVID woes. <laughs> it's also... <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah. The, okay. it's, it's, it's also uh, rebelling and revolting in the pandemic. Uh, but, you know, I, the thing I was asking you about and these children is also the fact that social isolation has, uh, I, I, you know, when I was finishing the book, it, the pandemic was just starting. So, you know, it was just, uh, the epilogue was the fact that, I, you know, I've been telling children to get out, to get out, leave the gadget, go out as an outdoors. And now after a year and a half, they are finally understanding the value of the outdoors, of nature, of, of meeting somebody physically versus constantly being on the gadget. The fact that all they want to do now is to go out in the park, just meet somebody, play a game of football. It's been a very heavy learning, right? But thank heavens it's been there because you're yeah. absolutely right. Some of the most beautiful phrases I've heard um, from 18-year-olds uh, is that, you know, I have appreciated the beauty of a sunset on a monsoon, you know. Oh, and, and I just think 
wow. <laughs> uh, here was a child who, uh, you know, wouldn't be in a position to give his assignments on time in school. Yet this, you know, it's this, this particular period has caused us all to introspect and think about what it is that we need. And when you think about it, what really matters in life are just your relationships, are the love that you get and you receive. It's not about what you have. And, uh, and you realize you can make do with so little. As long as you have that sense of security about being cared for and you have the opportunity to care for and you know the strength and joy of communication and support and the warmth of friendship. Um, people have used technology to still continue to remain in touch. Uh, I who have always preferred human interaction over uh, um, online interaction have also appreciated the fact that I can connect with uh, friends and loved ones overseas for the first time. I lost my husband during this time and it was not due to COVID, it was due to cancer. Um, and there were two or three, uh, it was very, I, it was just very, very strange how fast it happened. But I saw that uh, I was not alone. There were many others in my position who have lost a loved one. And the kind of overwhelming support, Jyotsna, that I got from my friends, family of course, but from friends, was, um, is to be cherished and to be very grateful for. So this time has brought both pain and loss. But I think for many it has given us a sense of gratitude that we have so much, the privilege that we live in, we have so much to be grateful for. And if we aren't, and we don't consider each day as a blessing, then I think we deserve what we get. <laughs> I don't think I can ask you anything after this. You've pretty much summed it all so nicely and, you know, poignantly that there is really nothing else to say or ask anymore. And uh, I'm just going to leave it at this. And uh, I'm wishing you really all the very best. You are an icon. You are actually a brand in yourself, whether you realize that or not. And uh, I'm wishing you the very best for your book. I can't wait to read that because there is so much that you say that resonates with me. And uh, I hope that we can make some changes. I hope that there is some lesson that's learned for, uh, for us and you know, our, those who make our education policy going forward, given that, and the education budget as well. But, uh, you know, that's crucial. I mean, that the 4% internet in rural India, that's dismal. If, if, you know, if we come back to thinking that a hybrid way of teaching will forever be hovering around us, we can never attain anything then. No. So, no. yes. No. So I, I'm, I'm going to leave it at this. And thank you very much, Abha, for joining me. And Not I at all, it's been a pleasure.